Greetings, darklings from across the interwebs. It is once again I, the Duchess Precious Ken, for the Sounds and Shadows podcast. And I got a really exciting guest for today. Uh, it's something a bit different, and I can't wait to get into that. Before I do, I wanted to give a shout out um, over at Smalls in Detroit last week. Uh, Colin and I went in there, um, and Whitney, and we went to the Industrial Pride Fest uh, at Smalls with leather strip headlining. And uh, I got to say this right because it's a tongue twister and I always do. It's Blague Plaque, like Black Plague, but Blague Plaque and then Croon, uh, who I talk about a lot and you know I'm a big fan of. Absolutely amazing. Such a great energy. And I'm kind of blown away that there isn't more because opening... Uh, ideas about sexuality and fashion and things like that are such a part of this scene. And yet I don't see that many pride related events that happen around the music in this scene and should. So it was just great to be a part of that. And I'd never seen Leather Strip before. And Klaus did 90 minutes straight. I mean, and he is not a spring chicken, but he did 90 minutes absolutely crushing it up on that stage uh wearing uh you know leather uh you know straps and not much else and just going at it um throwing down industrial music so super cool and i have some video footage for that and i'll have a written piece up on the page now without further ado um recently in the scene a lot of us got really excited because i stumbled across a piece uh i think i talked about it on a different podcast um, for the Grammys that had top 10 new industri or new goth bands coming out uh, in the scene. And that's really cool that I feel like I always talk about this goth renaissance, but to really see it get mainstream press that way, um, a lot because of the, uh, you know, festival out there in California, the uh, uh, Cruel Waves, uh, I think was part of it that led in. But a lot of the bands on there that were picked are ones we talk about on this show all the time, you know, actors, twin tribes, uh, crooks lies, you know, and when I read through it, I'm like, this is somebody who knows their stuff. This is, they have their finger on the pulse of what's happening. It, I look them up and it is my extreme pleasure to introduce to everybody, the author of that article, Brian Reisman. Welcome. Hola. How you doing? Brian, it's, it's so good. Like I said, I was just really stoked when I saw this. And when we kind of did that, uh, I was mentioning before the show, uh, the goth draft where we kind of had our Illuminati sewing circle of all the <laughs> yes. goth review pages together talking. And we were all kind of talking about that. And when I watched some of your podcasts, I heard you even refer to yourself as a bit of a closet goth, I think is the word that you used at it sometimes. <laughs> And yeah. I always like to ask, starting out, there was a moment where you, whether it was you saw a show, you heard a record for the first time, you saw Susan Saranda and the hunger and a lesbian sex scene. I don't know what it was, <laughs> but what was that moment for you where you got into this dark macabre music and and seen and apparently that kind of went along with you and stuck with you even when you started branching out and do a lot of other things you know it's interesting i think it was i was living in la i went to school in new york and i was living in la for a couple of years with my first girlfriend and i started writing for a fanzine called ie which is about sort of experimental music new music and i had read some stuff about project i know i guess i was at a point in my life i always liked kind of dark things i was a metal kid i loved horror movies my poor parents it was just like endless and dark <laughs> things going on and uh literally my bedroom was covered with pages of Kerrang! and all these metal magazines all over. And right above my bed, there's a picture of King Diamond holding a skull with an upside down cross paint on his forehead saying, Satan is a boy's best friend. <laughs> and I guess my parents must have thought, well, he's an honor student. He's not getting in trouble. No one's getting knocked out for fine. You know, he can, he can, <laughs> he can, uh, <laughs> he can I got a lot that. of that from my dad to the Marine Corps drill sergeant who oh, would wow. look at me in my eyeliner and the trench coat and, the, and would just be like, you know what? You look like an idiot, but if that's what you're going for, that's fine. And it, but the long hair for me didn't start till college. I just started this not, I said, it's not cutting it after a while, just trim it. And then uh, I think it was the early nineties. I just had gone through a shift in my life and, and some things had changed and my relationship had ended. And for some reason I got drawn to a lot of the project stuff 
I think I got into dark ambient music. And then I got into Project and Project. You know, Sam Rosenthal, like things like Black Tape for a Blue Girl. It was in Lycia. It was different. It wasn't traditional goth. I'd heard the Sisters before. Nope, sure. I'd heard the Cure. We remember when Wish came out. I was working music retail while I was also trying to work in the film industry, and that was like that was a bit of a poppier <laughs> yeah album for them. But I started to appreciate that stuff, and I don't know. I got drawn into it, and I'm one of those people that when I get into something, I just have to buy as much of it as I can. Like I mean, after Stranger Things, I interviewed a couple of the guys in Survive who were doing the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Then that tipped me off to Synthwave, and then suddenly, thanks to Spotify, I have you know two dozen new Synthwave artists that I can listen sure. to. Um, so yeah, I just got I got into the project stuff. Then I got into there was Metropolis, there was Cleopatra, there was Test Records. I would just I would I would find obviously Propaganda was a popular one, but there was also Permission, yep. uh, B side out of Jersey was a really interesting one. Um, there just was all these different fanzines, and I just got into it, and I would discover Hyperium, you know, bands like Love yeah. Is Colder Than Death. So I don't know. I mean, right now I'm wearing my, you know, my Scully shirt from Robert. Grant. A lot of times you people don't remember that there was a time before the Internet when maybe all we had was like <laughs> bulletin board systems, you know, that you go. Yeah. But like you couldn't just have Spotify or like Google. And so we talked about this. Um, I interviewed Sam recently and talked with him because yeah. they just had the 40th uh anniversary which makes me feel old saying that out loud of kind of doing project records and uh, yeah <laughs> and so but the samplers like cleopatra samplers project record samplers mm -hmm. that was google back then for us you would go down like once a month i would go down to the record store and sift through and get these samplers and that's how i'd find eight new bands i don't know i might know two or three off the sampler but that's how exactly. i find the rest and then you'd find those CDs and order them. And that was such a big part of the culture. So I love hearing you say that. And zines were such a part of that too. And it's kind of cool. I'm starting to see that come back where our online zines are leading to like Obscure Undead and a lot of other ones, uh, Procession, are putting out text ones, again, uh, printed media, because I think there is something special about having a bookshelf of them, holding them, smelling the pages, Finding them in a box. I'm a, I'm a physical media later. guy, as you can see. I mean, I yeah. have my Blu-rays are in the other room. I've got a whole bunch of magazines here. I have 18 long boxes of comics. I mean, I I am that I am that guy. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, I I like to do that too, and especially like records. I've gotten back into with this because there's something special about the ritual of it, like taking it out of the sleeve, setting it down, watching the needle drop. There's something to be said. I mean, uh, I mean, you know. My favorite goth band, Faith and the Muse, put this out many moons ago. I mean, this is the kind of stuff people don't do. I mean, they're doing these limited edition things now, yeah. right? I mean, now are you are you a fan? Yeah. Have you heard the new Bellwether Syndicate, uh, Williams' new project? I do, and it's got a bit more of a punk sound to it too, because obviously yeah, it's got like a lot also. of. And I always was, picture when he's when I listen to it and I hear him singing that he has like a Billy Idol lip curl while he's throwing <laughs> the the lyrics out, and especially. I always say that William is one of, when you see him perform live, one of the most rock star looking guys still in the scene in terms of, I don't know, that is just my image in my head of what I want a rock star to look like up on stage. Like William has that energy so much. I mean, I saw, look, I saw Faith and Amuse do an acoustic set 97 at Project Fest in Chicago. Then I saw them with the full band at the bank in 98 oh, New wow. York. And that was an intense show. He's really into it. And that's something that, yeah, it's funny because I was I was debating whether I should put the Bellwether Syndicate into my into my goth list for Grammy, sure. but I I got to the point where like I've I've covered goth in the past for Billboard previously for Grammy for the Observer, uh, years and years ago for CMJ and Detour and all these other places, and this time around I'm like I got I mean I know the singer for Crew Lies has been as a Crew Lies or Crux Lies I always thought it was Crux Crux Lies. Lies. I don't know how I I always said it that way, but you know. Um, and then there's also, uh, you know, and the keyboard for nightclub is, is, is he's older than, mm -hmm. than Emily, but like, I, I feel like, you know, I wanted to get some of the newer and, and some people debated my use of the term new, and I probably should have said modern, but somebody great made a great comment. I think it was under the post-punk post of this on Facebook when they shared the story is like compared to the other bands in the scene that have been around since the late seventies, yeah, they are new bands. <laughs> I, I do think of it. Well, and here's the other thing. A lot of times now there is a movement away from 19 20 year old kids or something being the ones in bands you rarely ever see that i mean even like top bands in the scene now say like actors 
Yeah. Jason's older than I am. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, he's because you have to be pretty established, usually a producer yourself and have enough money to have a halfway decent home studio and gear and the knowledge of kind of what club owners, what people to get a hold of. Honestly, like yeah. it's hard to get off your feet until you're almost 30 in this day and age, you know, for music, for a lot of, of this genre. Well, and, Ethan Marulis and I were talking about this before and after I did the goth story for Grammy. Yeah. We talked about the whole the bedroom project thing now because a lot of these groups, you get that sense like I could discover Witch of the Veil vale through Bandcamp, sure, right? Yeah. And that's that's a group that sounds like they probably started recording in like this cottage somewhere in the, you know, in the Highlands somewhere. And and but you know it's hard to get out there and doing that. And I remember twenty, well, twenty fifteen was the last time I saw. It. I was back in Chicago, saw Scary Lady Sarah and saw Frozen Auto, but she did an interview with me, I think, for my World Goth Day piece later on. And she was pointing out that it was hard. They were, it was pointing out how difficult it was to get a lot more of the baby bats to come in. That it was, you were seeing, it wasn't quite the same as when I was into it in the 90s, man. It was like a lot of people got into it. I know the Hot Topic mall goth thing is an issue, you know, and there was this mainstream kind of cribbing, like Madonna doing the Frozen video. And then allegedly being offended when somebody called her goth. I'm like, oh, really? So you're just going to steal the look for your video and then get annoyed later. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> Madonna slaps. I, I, you know, and, and I, I'd say even she had kind of done goth aesthetic well before that, say like, like a prayer, or, you know, things like that. And I don't know, like, I think that's totally okay. That part doesn't bother me. And yeah, look, goth has always been, and I think I said this a little bit to you earlier when we were talking that. Part of it is that it was an open door for exploration of things that weren't okay, maybe in other clubs, you know, whether it was sexuality or aesthetic or whatever. Yeah. It's always been, you can get your freak on and be something else here. And a lot of times I think, you know, nobody came firing out of the womb with the intimate knowledge of the Sisters of Mercy's early B-sides or something. Like we all found this at a different time and in a different way. And I'm one of those that says, let's encourage young people that aren't into the music, but are just coming there for the fashion of it. Look, if you hear Floodlands, if you, you know, when it comes on, kids are going to find that and be like, what is that that slaps? And let that speak for itself instead of kind of, to me, trying to force it down their throats. Let them find this music because they will. And we all come to it in a different way. And when they do, it'll be all the stronger in the scene for it because you open arm welcomed them, you know? Well, you know, when I did the story, I mean, we were talking about how you said, you said probably about eight of the 10 bands are on the list would be bands that you would have picked. Sure. Um, which is cool. That's a nice, that's a nice uh, <laughs> coincidence. Like, but at the same, at the same time, I was, when I was writing the story, I knew that there were like, people mentioned other bands. I mean, there's like Mark E. Moon, you know, who have a couple of cool tracks I've heard sure. on compilations. I'm trying to think of like other bands that are out there's actors there's uh, I mean and then you have a group someone like Hanta from Paris who kind of crosses more into the synth pop kind of electro yeah. vein but her stuff has this moodiness to it that I really like her bedless bones which is sort of makes me think of dead Can Dance on electronic out of Estonia but I had to, I also to, one you know, of the you know, only bands I've ever known from Estonia I call okay. that out uh, to her all the time. <laughs> another big one because you're talking about a lot of European ones another one I'd shout out there and say like I am the shadow Pedro Code from uh, Portugal to yes. me has the best baritone in modern goth period but, you know but yeah there's there's a lot that I mean I've done a list like yours before and I think mine had forty on it but you narrowed it down to ten <laughs> I had to I don't remember I mean you're dealing me, with though, a mainstream outlet you you hit the 10, I think, most likely to welcome in somebody that wasn't already looking for God. That's, and, and thank so, you. That was the point. Yeah. I mean, I love a lot of other stuff. I, I mean, again, there's, we, we've talked about a bunch of different artists that are really cool. There, there's only so much space. And I mean, originally I was pitching it as a, as a total overview. I'd written a story for Billboard. I think it was Convergence 25, I think it was what, 2019? Yep. So I remember I know Tony Lee, DJ, DJ Arcanish from the Boston scene from the 90s. And so I did a thing on Billboard, but I did also have a lot of veteran. I tried to mix the veteran acts with some newer people. Um, I remember when I did my Grammy piece nine years ago, the editor at the time, I think it actually edited out one of the paragraphs with all the newer stuff. And I started getting a lot of flack from people. I'm like, you got to put it back in. That was the yeah. point of the paragraph. And they did. She, To her credit, she's, I mean, she's long gone from there. But like, she, she, she put it back in because I'm like, you know, we have, I'm mentioning Witch House and all this other stuff. You can't take that out because it makes it look kind of just covering like old bands 
And it's tricky, though, because what you're talking about is there are these artists that have been around for a long time. Yeah. That are, and, and it's the same problem. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big metal kid from back in the 80s, uh, you know, and there's another thing where everyone, the, one of the complaints I get even from people, you know, middle aged Gen X, just like myself, where you're saying, well, yeah, it's, it's cool to keep going to see the, the, the legends, but we have to, they're costing more money to go see them. And if you spend all that money on them, you're not going to go see the baby bands. And one of my arguments, like Bruce Springsteen charging ridiculous amounts, of, they're letting him, let, he's letting people charge ridiculous amounts of money for the, the, the really good seats. It's like, well, for the money you're going to spend on that, if you've already seen him, go see like 10 bands you haven't seen. Or right. more, go support other artists. No, you were. You were I saw them last year. It was great. Yeah. It was only 10 bucks. I mean, you were preaching like... to the choir that the speech you just gave is one I give on this show yeah. a lot. <laughs> and no, I mean, I, I couldn't have said it better. I mean, that is dead on true. And I think one of the other problems is goth almost more than any other scene is obsessed with the past. Like it really is one of those that I feel like you draw your cred like people think you get paid a pension or something for how many years you have in the way people, you know, will just cling to those original, the cure, the sisters, the mission, old bands, and and not really want to move on. And, and that's how a scene dies. You have to be ready to, and part of it is what you were talking about. Goth has splintered to the point where, frankly, I rarely ever use that word in a review or something anymore. I use dark scene now. Um, I, I just like that as a more yeah, dark music yeah. word because the way things have with electronica, with dark wave, post punk, cold wave, uh, witch house, like all these things, really they're under the goth umbrella. But these new fractures and flavors to me are what has kept it fresh and interesting because I think who is it I yeah. just oh it was John Robb who I, I you called out in this article when I interviewed yeah, they sent me his book and I started getting um, into it. Like, his I have book to mention this come book. out yeah <laughs> I was talking to John and he had this great quote in the book that was something like every scene does something brilliant for the first two years of its existence. And then like starts watering down from there as you go on and on. So you kind of mm. almost have to, in a lot of ways, invent these new splinter genres to me to find the freshest meat. Well, but that's but that's that was what was so exciting about the 90s. I got into goth in the 90s. So I heard the sisters, my friend of mine had Floodland, and we I got I I got into I sort of I sort of did ask backwards. I got into the project Hyperion, Metropolis, all that stuff in the nineties. And like, I loved Rosetta Stone, you know, Adrenaline is not an official album release in the UK. It's a compilation for America, but that's still, I'll get in trouble for saying this to some people, but like, like the song, like sense of purpose, it's like sisters of mercy, given a heavy metal kick in the ass. And I think it's better yeah. than the sisters. Like I love a lot of sisters, but Rosetta Stone were songwriters. The thing that the sisters do is work. Andrew Eldridge loves to work a groove, work a vibe for six, yeah. eight, 10, 12 minutes but there's not a lot of songwriting there. Faith in the Muse, great songwriting. Uh, yeah. Rosetta Stone, great songwriting. I remember seeing the Prophetess live. They were a band. They were a rock band. One band that I loved, This Ascension. I saw them live twice. You know, I was saying before we went on, the drummer Matt Ballesteros, I mean, he uh, ran Test Records. I went to visit him in Santa Barbara once, and one of his employees like, crashed there for a night with him, and we went around Santa Barbara. Um, and uh, they were a real band. I mean, this is a band that was like Dead Can Dance if, if if they became a rock band. And it was also ethereal and haunting. I saw them live in a church in Cambridge and Harvard Square. And then I saw them live at the Middle East downstairs. In the late 90s, Matt told me that Arista was sniffing around, I think, from I remember that, mm -hmm. that. And unfortunately, I think Columbine and the mall goth thing combined, just that one-two, really bad one-two punch of the watering down, as you were saying, and the misidentification of those shooters as goths just did something because I felt like goth was moving up. I, I was writing, I was getting mainstream magazines that were interested kind of in covering more of this stuff. And yeah. all of a sudden it just, I don't know. And part of it too is William Faith. And I think I talked about this maybe sometime in the 2000s, the, the laptop band thing, more of it started to be like, you have a whole, you have a two or three, four people, but there's no drummer and I'm a drummer and I want to see a drummer. You know, I saw Crooks Lies last year. Great. I mean, Ian, amazing energy. The guitarist enforcing it. Well, he was his wife was expecting a baby, so he couldn't make it. So they couldn't do blue, which is the song I wanted to hear. Um, they promised me they'd do it next time. I have to write an article to get my my song request in. That's how that that, that works. But like, <laughs> you know, awesome. they still he had energy, but I want to see even Human League many, many years ago decided to bring in an actual drummer. I know he's imitating these program parts, but like 
at least some of the bands like, you know, Cloud Full of Ravens do some interesting tom-tom rhythms. And, yeah. you know, Sisters tended to have that very kind of steady groove going on. And that's fine. I, I love a lot of that stuff. But I feel like maybe the thing with goth is it needs to have, we need to have more full bands. Because, there, you know. There is, yeah, some of that still happening. But I'll tell you, like, as somebody who is in a goth band that, you know, plays that, part of it at this point is very much economic. Like to yeah. have a drummer with you, it's a lot of stuff to add on to bring. Like our loadout right now, we have in-ear monitors, we have direct line guitar amps, bass amps, all yeah, of that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And we can basically go to a show in the back of a Subaru Outback or on I a I know plane. it's a space thing too. I know that. On a plane, that's another yeah. thing to like do a festival or something. But like when you got a drummer because the days of a record label buying a giant tour bus for you are few and far between. So that's just not happening. Even, even for somebody, you know, kind of at the top of the goth scene, like an actors or twin tribes or something modern, yeah. they still aren't getting that. And so that's what I think makes it hard. And you're right though. It, it has killed the live energy a lot when you are pushing a button you know, and then going and doing the show. And you got to think up a new and creative way to do something interesting on stage when you don't have the pounding depth of drums behind you to kind of ride that wave. Well, I mean, I mean, look, I can watch, I can, I've watched live footage of Twin Tribes. And I want to see them next time they come into town because I know they played Mercury Lounge here in New York. Um, you can still do it, but I do think that I, I, I remember what, looking for last year for footage of drab majesty from cruel world and it took a while before somebody posted something at least maybe it's i hadn't right after i just couldn't find it and you know a lot of my friends who went they don't know about cold cave they don't know about the younger bands because i and part of the joy of being a music journalist and entertainment journalist is i get exposed to so much stuff i never would have at the same time i was that guy in the 90s that was still going to go to newberry comics in boston and i was just going to dig into the bins buy the compilations when i was a metal kid in the 80s yeah, my poor parents, like I, I had them buy me things like Anthrax Fistful of Metal, which is a gory cover for Christmas. And they did. And I would collect all of this stuff based on covers sometimes. And I think I would do that with some goth and dark wave, elect industrial, I mean, World Serpent. Those 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 imports were really expensive. So I had to be careful. You had to really buy a compilation first. Yeah. Decide if you're going to drop 25 bucks on a CD. Um I don't know. I, I love the music. I, I think there's probably some people who a lot of people seem very happy with the article. There's probably some people who thought I've no, you know, I'm not really I haven't really gone to as many live shows in recent years for a variety of reasons. First, we have the pandemic. And then secondly, I can go back and forth to Boston. My parents are getting older, so I, I've sort of certain priorities. But I I'm I'm excited by the fact that there's a lot of this new talent. I mean, Bandcamp and Spotify and YouTube, it's amazing what you can discover. And at the same time, it reminds me of the CD revolution of the 90s, where suddenly you know, I could get albums by indie bands that never would have reached me before, which was great. But the labels did have to invest more money because you had to you had to deal with the distribution and you had to deal with retail getting their cut. So there's still a bit more of a uh, a need to have a plan. Nowadays, things are digital. So you can just put stuff out on your label, which is just all streaming. But I wonder, you know, it, it, it's great for lower overhead. I'd be curious to talk to a lot of people running labels now. Like, well, what's in what is the, how do you work out everything else? Sure. You know, there's, the tour support thing is very minimal. It was, it was look in the nineties, it was minimal back then, man. It was not, it's not yeah. like these labels. But, but that's drop what you have to cash. do now to, I mean, to sell physical media, you need to go on tour and that's just yeah. it. Like a lot of bands now are like, like me, you don't do it without a day job. You know what I mean? So yeah. it isn't, the, you got to really go all in to get to a place like a twin tribes or actors or crooks that where you can go on a four week, five week, two. like I would say twin tribes, even like Joel was a school teacher when they were kind of starting out and he would have to try and like work it out to squeeze on like summer oh. break, a three or four week tour to like get back in time to get things ready for his class to pick up, to start teaching again, you know, and I, it, it's a different world. And it goes to kind of what you were saying, the positive of that. It, it was back in the 90s to record an album. You had to go to a studio for 250 bucks an hour, hope that you got the takes right in the very small budget that maybe you had, and then you'd maybe get a label to notice you. But nowadays, 
for $2,000, you can have basically that level of studio or that level of quiet in your bedroom do 10 million takes of the weirdest crap you can possibly think of and really push the boundaries, you know? (laughs) And, and so like there's give and take there's up and down, but I think that is one of the positives is goth has opened up creativity because bands can do that. But at the same time, it's a tidal wave now. It's so easy to get lost in the shuffle. If you haven't found something truly unique or interesting because there's just so much material and so many bands out there. Well, you know, this is the thing I have the problem with streaming. Like, I think the thing for me is I, I joke about my career. I'm like an octopus. So I cover music, books, comic books, film, TV, theater, and occasionally food business travel. So I have these tentacles that are all reaching out. I cannot keep up. I don't think even anybody who covers a genre or like a, a certain genre in movies or music, I don't even think it's that easy to even be an expert anymore anyway, because there is so much stuff coming out. You can't, you know, I can't, you can't make a full-time living writing about horror movies or goth bands unless you are the editor of a magazine that has a decent enough circulation or have a website that has enough traffic. You're still going to be doing something else. So trying to keep up with all this stuff with movies getting longer and albums getting longer, I just think it's like, it's, it's really difficult. And it's, I, I think it's amazing. At the same time, it's incredibly frustrating because with streaming, we're getting a lot of good stuff now. We're not getting that much amazing stuff so i look at a lot of the stuff that's on streaming a lot of really cool movies and tv series but if you want to judge quality how many of them are you actually ever going to want to go back and rewatch? how many albums do you listen to more than a half a dozen dozen times um, now i'm curious when you say that for tv i have one right now and you said you're a big horror fan yeah do you have any shows right now like in that dark genre that you feel like are doing something spectacular and can't miss right now but well, that's the thing is I'm trying to keep up with everything. I started watching the last, I watched a bit of The Last of Us. And then the frustrating thing about good. it, the third episode, of course, with a gay couple and the, it being such a different story was incredibly moving. And it, it was on, on a variety of levels, but that could have been a standalone movie. The other episodes I've seen, is kind of like The Walking Dead to me, where I've seen so many post-apocalyptic movies. I've seen the scenario before. It looks amazing. Love Pedro Pascal, love all these people. But yeah. I sort of sit there going... It's a bunch of assholes. We're going to give each other a hard time. You know, there's a couple of cool people, but everyone's going to be trying to jockey for a position. There's it's survivalism. And after all, I'm like, oh man, I just, I, I don't know. We're getting to that point anyway. Did you see the sky's orange recently? I mean, it's like not yeah, a comet out there. So I, I don't know if we're really. <laughs> the Walking Dead is the best mediocre show on television. I, 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 <laughs> after two seasons, I stopped. I mean, I, I kind of got into the Junji Ito, you know, Maniac, the anime, yeah. because I love his stuff. Um, Okay, mine that you have to check out that yeah. I'm obsessed with right now from on MGM Plus. Uh, mm. It's the guys who did Lost, but now they have so much money, they don't have anybody looking over their shoulder. And I think they made the show they always wanted to make back then if they didn't have to answer to anybody. It, it's incredible, it, especially if you like horror. It's the best horror movie slash TV show anything I've seen in forever. There's, I mean, there's, I mean, I started watching the Del, the Del Toro, you know, I think Cabinet of Curiosities. That was good. It's good. I mean, again, it's not blowing me away. Um, I, but I, I'll, I'm going to go into a different medium here. I just saw this on Broadway, and I interviewed the playwright for Spin, so that's Ooh. going to be coming out soon. This, you know, some people like it, some people don't. It gets a bit abstract, but it's the first time I've seen a show on on Broadway in a long time. But they rarely do horror. It's like singing fucking vampires. Pardon my French, and like. You're uh, fine. No, we fucking I can't. swear on this show. We're not trying to get. God damn it! I mean, I like you know. Want. I mean, look, Sweeney Todd is back, and Sweeney Todd is awesome. But it's not full on horror. It's got horrific elements. Unless you're sitting close, you're not going to see all the blood spurting. Yeah. Um, Martin McDonough's stuff, like the, the Pillow Man and a Behanding in Spokane, that has elements of horror because it's this grisly real life yeah. stuff. Um, Lieutenant of Inishmore had cut up body parts all over the stage in the second act. But like to get a thing like Grey House, which is supernatural and existential and actually really creeps, can creep you the fuck out at certain points, that to me is a rarity. And I want to see more of that. Um, there's a lot of sound design that goes along with it. I interviewed Levi Holloway, who's the, the playwright, and he's totally into like, his dad took him to see Nightmare on Elm Street when he was five years old. <laughs> awesome. it's like, it, it, you know, that kind I mean, of crazy. Up a awesome. little bit at the beginning. Um, my first horror movie that my dad took me to see was American Werewolf in London when I was 12 years old. That and that it. was that was freaky enough at 12. Um, I think my big one like that is and and it wasn't it was on TV 
and nobody let me. I kind of wandered into it, but I saw Poltergeist when I was probably, yeah, like around like eight or nine. I saw in the theater, man. Oh. And that messed me <laughs> up. That freaking clown and that tree still i think of is one of the scariest scenes in a movie maybe just for the The meat and the guy kind of peeling his own face off that 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 was was freaky that was an interesting time in the 80s because that's when pg-13 had to start coming in because they were pushing the envelope on stuff Mm -hmm. and they weren't sure how far they could go with it um i mean 80s horror i love the 80s 80s is a mixed bag in terms of some really amazing stuff like the howling you know that came out and then there's other stuff where it was like this sequelitis Although I still have a very big soft spot for Friday the 13th, Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. It's just one of those so bad, it's good movies. Wasn't that uh, the Eddie Furlong one? Oh. Wasn't he in that one? I'm trying to remember. I think that was. Which one was he in? I thought I it was to... Jason Takes Manhattan, but I couldn't. It, could have, it might have You know, it's funny. I mean, Kelly Who was in it. And she went on to do Nash Bridges and I think Scorpion yeah. King. Um it's funny because I, I actually did a Freddy versus Jason trivia game like 15 years ago. A buddy of mine had started it and he couldn't finish it. And I had to come in and I had to watch all those movies again and come up with all these trivia questions. I did, I went for, I did one for Caddyshack and I watched Caddyshack 12 times in two weeks or something. I'll never need to watch that movie. I don't remember half of it anymore, but I crammed like for a test. And I kind of feel writing articles like when I did the goth thing or I did like three listicles in the same two weeks. And you are like a lot of bands I loved, and then there's stuff that I also wanted to learn more about. And so I had to cram and really absorb all of this stuff and go, wow, this is it is overwhelming. Um, and I, I want to ask you, I, th- yeah. I think changing gears a little bit. So when you did this article, I mean, obviously, yeah, you had some background in this scene, obviously. And yeah, yeah. and I see that, I mean, like you said, the octopus, you write a lot of other genres. I'm gonna ask you about Jean Bon Jovi in a minute, because I'm a big fan there. Oh, there we go. But, um what was some of how do you go about doing research for something like this and does somebody reach out to you at your various publications and kind of know okay brian's kind of the goth guy so if we wanted to do something in metal or in got he's a good person to reach out to to do this or do you raise your hand when you see it come across the possibility table and say "Ooh, i want that and then what are your steps in kind of doing some research to get yourself back up to date, maybe if it isn't something you've been covering lately? You know, it's interesting. I, I usually, certain publicists, since I'm freelance, certain publicists will know who I am and go, we should pitch Brian on this. So I get those emails automatically. Um, but then for something like this, I, I like I went to Ethan Marulis, um, uh, who else was I emailing with? I think it's an industrial DJ in LA. Is it David Christian? You know, he was. Yep, uh, yeah, Earth, he I, you mentioned earlier Rex Arcana is probably a good resource for something like that. Yeah. And I, and do, I mean, I knew about a lot of these groups already. For some reason, Molcat Doma hadn't, even though they're huge, I had yeah. known about them, but hadn't really been listing that much. And then, you know, they were the last band I included, uh, uh, to be honest. And it was funny because I was going through and I just I added up the streams on their songs on Spotify and I was like, three albums, like 470 or 475 million combined streams. So, and they were just finishing a massive North American tour. Right. I mean, for something like this, I just, I, I, I'll i talk to friends of mine who are like, one of my old editors at Playboy, Robert DeSalvo is a big goth. I don't think I actually got a chance to talk to him before that did the piece, but uh, I reach out to different people. And I also just go online and I'm like, I go through all, my, all, all the band camp stuff that I have compilations and then see what other people are covering it's funny because i was sitting there thinking i wonder how you know the whole goth scene is going to react because i was immersed in it in the latter half of the 90s going into early 2000s but this is really funny so i'm finding this site called downersclub.com i know what this is all i know is i I looked this up to see what like new goth bands my story comes up first because it's the newest but here in march of 2022 here are their five bands the birthday massacre motionless in white three teeth Lord of the Lost and Strange Bones. And like we're getting into some metal territory and we're getting yeah. into like Motionless in White to me is not a goth band. They are, right. you can be goth adjacent if you want to say that. I mean, I would even really say that I, about Three Teeth. You know, I mean, I guess they're probably metal, industrial. I think a metal band. I'd say they lean more towards metal than industrial. Yes, exactly. So that's that's like, that's the mainstream version of goth. Yeah. And I know that like in picking all those artists, I, one of the things I had to do with this on top of doing the research and talking to friends of mine and plus half the bands on the list I already liked anyway. Um, was, you know, which bands are also getting the biggest play? Because when you're writing for a mainstream outlet, you have to tell your editor. And my editor was into the idea anyway, but I was like, you have to tell that you have to say, look, this band like nightclub gets anywhere from half a million to 6 million views per video. And they have a lot of videos and they're very savvy with what they do. Um, you know, somebody uh, say like, and I think one of them that you had on there is a vision video, like Dusty, who really, 
you know, I mean, has a great band in place, but was able to propel themselves because of a, a TikTok bit. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah, really yeah. where the I notoriety about... came from was they did this goth dad character and that made their band people. It brought eyes to them. And from there, their band, because it's incredibly good, blew up. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I had them on the list, but they were one of the people that I, I knew. There's a bunch that I knew about, but like, yeah, you know, I'm scrolling down again. It's like she passed away, obviously, and Lebanon Hanover have had each of had like a big track. Kaylin Mikla, I just discovered because I went to see them open for Ville Valo. Oh, they're so amazing. And, live. And I, met like them, watching, I met them upstairs in the like VIP. Like they were the sweetest people. Pixies scream at you. It's incredible. <laughs> they, were, they were very nice when I met them. They were cool. And I was like, this band has to be included. And maybe... You know, one of one of the I one I got a couple there's some nice com, a couple of nice comments. I got like one woman said it was like the best mainstream article she'd seen on Goth in a long time, and I was like that was yeah. very sweet. Then another guy was like, well, I feel like he was struggling with the list because there's like some of this stuff doesn't quite fit into the sort of the standard definition. I'm like, well, but dude, that's the point. Like to me, Goth isn't even a genre anymore. It's like you said, it's an umbrella. Right. And if you just and Ethan said he enjoyed the list because I didn't just pick ten sisters clones. You know, Kaylin Mikla is residing kind of on the fringes, but very much like kind of to the punk rock side, I would say almost. You know? Yeah, but there is, but there is, there are these goth and synth pop elements. There's sure. avant garde sounds, and what's great is if people can go to a list like this, and then that gets them into these other groups because they're going to go onto Bandcamp, they're going to go on and discover what label they're on, they're going to go onto Spotify and get recommendations, they're going to go into YouTube and see other recommended videos. Yeah. Then they're going to discover, like the way I did with Synthwave recently in the last few years, this whole new world. And it's it's tricky because I don't know that goth is ever going to be mainstream. Like in the 80s, it's probably in terms of sales and perhaps sure. mainstream awareness, the biggest. And, and, and most of those acts, I don't I mean, I know Susie had at least one gold album, but they were not. I don't know if his sisters even ever had a gold record. And maybe, of course, they haven't tabulated any sales probably since like the 90s. So who knows if they actually paid to have a certification, how many units these things actually would have sold in America. In Europe, obviously, the sales numbers are bigger. They would have more chart success right. over there. America's always been very hard for a lot of a lot of kind of either fringe styles of music or things like goth and metal that have an underground, very healthy underground. Occasionally have a band that, especially more with metal, gets up here. But I've noticed that like a lot of the new wave stuff from the 80s, you know, way bigger success. AHA had way bigger success in Europe, in their homeland. They would have top 10 singles. They had, a, I mean, this was The Sun Always Shines on TV. That's like it was number 25 or something in America. Yeah. But like, you know, they had one number one. And then that's it. No, no one knows that. I just put together a Human League compilation uh, on Spotify. And I knew a lot of the 80s stuff. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to make myself listen to. The other stuff. And now I have like right. over 30 songs spanning like 1978 to 2011 that are all good songs, in my opinion, that span a wide range of styles of what they do. And but, you know, they still were born. Uh, that's more what they were known for things. is still the one song. Right. And that's a song that Phil Oakley didn't even like, actually, I think, right. until and, and they finally bands, came to terms I think with it. say that, you know, the she talks to angels thing or whatever, you know, like it's their least favorite like i saw the church play a few years back and i watched the like life drain out of his eyes when he had to sing under the milky way tonight like it, <laughs> it literally i could see it killing him which was the most goth thing ever which made it even better um they just toured actually yeah, they, they did and hoodoo, and hoodoo gurus another australian band actually were just yep. around i think I wanted to shout out too. I thought it was very uh, clever and cool that you put on there a very dear friend of mine, Pete Burns and Kill Shelter. Yeah, um, that's a recent discovery for me, by the way. Oh, it's really, really cool shit. I like he it. Masters uh, all of our albums and is a great nice. producer that kind of got into making his own music later in life. And one of the brilliant things about uh, Damage, which I called 2019's best uh, goth post punk album of the year. Um, mm -hmm. is that he took, he wrote all the songs, he wrote all the lyrics, but had a different singer for each song where you're kind of handing over a very delicate thing of your baby yeah. and having someone else sing it. But when you put that on there, kind of like you were talking about, adding him on is a spider web where you got to call out six different singers or contributors oh yeah yeah, yeah. that, that was a purpose that was a purpose For now <laughs> you kind of turn your top 10 list that way into a top 16 list by putting somebody like that on and i always love seeing Pete get love because he's just one of the 
just best folk in the scene right now. So he reached out to me. Um, you know, Ian from Crooks Lies reached out mm-hmm. to me. Now I'm gonna ask the official pronunciation, like, dude, what is it? Um, and then uh a couple other people did too. They were very they were actually very surprised. Um but I said, look, you know, I mean, I wish I could do more of it. I, my my dream would be to, you know, like I just started writing again. I did some writing, a little writing for spin 20 years ago. And I'm starting, I'm just doing starting out for spin.com. So I'll, I'm curious to see if I can, because my editor there, she's into like old school goth. I'm like, look, you got, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you into all these, all these other bands. They actually, funnily enough, the day that my Grammy piece dropped, spin also had a piece by Lisa Laudasur. I think hopefully I'm pronouncing her name right. Mm-hmm. At least in Canada, she's been in the goth scene a long time. She went to England and she was like, she did a, a, a different thing, but I, I I have a feeling she probably did it for the editor, my editor Liza that I was mentioning. And uh, I thought that was cool that like, you know, other people are recognizing that this is going on. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's still, I, I wish I could get, I mean, I wish I could just do a twin tribe story. You know, I want to get sure. their story. You know, I discovered. Uh, I think that's going to happen eventually. I think they're one of those that just they have all the pieces together. And And I think another thing with twin tribes is actors a lot of these people that are really successful boot blacks they tour all the time and not just tour they do the I thing do where you talked about where you can see actors bellwether syndicate and you know another band at a small club with 300 people for 15 bucks or you can see peter murphy's propped up corpse for $189, you know what I mean? Like try and get through a set. Um, I, then again, Love and Rockets, you know, the same age and same bit, just went out and killed it the other night and and looked amazing. But I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I think they have all the pieces and they also come up after the show, shake everybody's hand, say hello, have that attitude where they've done away with the aloof a-hole rock star because there just isn't a place for it anymore in 2023. And they're just welcoming kind, sweet people, you know? And like, that's what people want from their rock stars now, you know, is that kind of vibe well, instead of the bigger than life golden god you know well i like the bigger than life thing but i and it was why i didn't like a lot of the 90s because i felt a lot of people were trying to be the anti-rock star and it drove me up a wall but at the same time as much as i really disliked i really have a disdain for 90s mainstream a lot of 90s mainstream music the underground of the 90s which with the goth the dark ambient and i'm not talking ambient techno i'm talking about like real right. like robert rich and a lot of lust more and a lot of that other stuff um and you had like this world music thing going on and you had the and swing. There was sort of just a lot of interesting things happening in the 90s under the surface. Um, I thought it was interesting that Cher's son, Elijah Blue, had this group called Dead Sea. Mm-hmm. And they put out an album in 2002, called, I think it was called Commencement. They had a song called The Key to Gramercy Park. Then they got put on the Family Values Tour. And it was goth-ish, but I actually have the CD from four years earlier that I reviewed for Magnet. And they pulled the album right, right after I submitted the review, like decided not to release it. I guess they didn't think the production, they didn't think it was right. It kind of worked, but kind of didn't. Um, there's so much stuff. I don't know. I uh, The 90s was a great time. I feel like I feel like we are seeing right now, especially through an outlet like Bandcamp, you're seeing a lot of exciting artists. But I think the tricky part, and this is this, this goes, so this goes for rock bands too. It's good to have a good producer. It's good to, or a good A&R person or somebody who isn't like just a money person, but really understands who you are. If you look at a lot of the famous rock and metal bands, it's like ACDC, Mutt Lang, you know, Judas Priest, Tom Allen, um, sure. you know, uh, all these different people had somebody that they worked with and that helped shape who they are. And there's nothing wrong with that. And, and so what Ethan and I were talking about, the bedroom projects, you know, there's a lot of cool groups that started. You can tell it's, a, I mean, look, Porcupine Tree started that way. I was talking, interview, I've interviewed Stephen Wilson many times. And he told me a lot of it at the beginning was really him. Just like in his house, putting this stuff together, which is awesome. And then he eventually got a kick-ass band and went out on the road and then went solo and, and the whole thing. And they came back uh, last year, yeah. uh, Porcupine Tree. And so, but, you know, what do we do to get to the next level? At the same time, I look at, uh, I look at uh, you know, the goth scene. And I feel in some ways, at least when I was really a big part of it, and you can, and I still get that sense of, of like, it's it's inclusive. But it doesn't want to be this big thing. Yeah. Like, I think a lot of goths are perfectly happy if they have their scene, it gets a little bigger. But you don't want like everybody and their mom to suddenly start looking goth because, you know, it's like when people say, you oh, want it to be a counterculture. Way. Yeah. Like if yes. you lose that, that's part of your identity. 
And like the Kylie Jenner was dressed goth the other night. I like, no, she wasn't. She was dressed in black. There's a really big difference. Sometimes People they do. have been wearing cocktail dresses a long time before Kylie Jenner did it. It doesn't make you goth, you know. Yeah. Now, I know if she was, maybe if she had like a Victorian corset and she had a certain look with her eyeliner and she was like, she put in some things that were personal touches. And, but you know, I mean, it, it's cool that like, you know, Jenny Ortega on, on uh, the Wednesday, Wednesday Adam, or, I mean, obviously yeah. she doesn't know it. And yet I admire the fact that she went back and watched like 80s goth videos. She got into the cramps. Like she at least re she respected where it came from, right. and then between that and then was a show Lockwood and Company, which is a British supernatural detective yep. I show. I like that one. I watched it. I'm actually that was, that was one that was interesting. Actually, I was we were talking yeah. about some new shows, and it's got '80s goth tunes in it. Right. It's got a good I'm sense kind of, of obsessed humor. with teenage supernatural dramas. Uh, so yeah, I watch and know them all. <laughs> actually, that's my dream job: is to do the be the person in charge of doing the music for. Uh, supernatural CW or whatever crappy teenage dramas uh, so that they stop just doing bad 80s covers and let me put twin tribes and whatnot in the uh, shows. Well, you know, I'm Gen X and I mean, you're younger than me, so you're millennial. So it's like there's a definite, uh, you know, right now, Gen Xers are really running a lot of the music supervi supervision in Hollywood. If you really look at all the shows and the music and what's interesting is that younger people, actually, a lot of them do like the music I grew up with and it's not the same there's a musician, uh, Jacob Holm Lupo, who's in White Willow. It's a prog band out of mm -hmm. Norway. And I've written some line notes for him. And he was pointing out that his daughter is really into like his music from the 80s. And he says, that's like when if we were kids in the 80s and into music from the 40s, he's like, that's mind boggling to me. And I'm like, yeah, but the difference is after I think once, especially once the 80s kicked in because of digital production, the sound quality of a lot of 80s tunes is stronger than anything that came previous to that. Yes, a lot of it has the cheesy sense and blah, blah, blah. But there's music that one of my friends on Facebook said she was playing this song. I don't know. I don't know who it was. I don't think it was Human League, but it was something it was something 80s ish. And her daughter's like, this is a great new song. She's like, this is like, you know, 1983. And her kid had no idea because it just sounded cool. Yeah, and that's I, that's the meme these days is the, you know, some uh, daughter rolling her eyes and explaining to her mom what Rocky or a pitcher show is or something like that. You know? <laughs> well, they, they you wouldn't think, get it, mom. You don't understand. Hey, man, my generation had gender fluidity going on back in the 80s. I mean, one of my high school classmates said her dad would see people like Boy George and Grace Jones and Annie Lennox, all these people and say, you know, they're very brave. Because if you think what we're dealing with right now is bad, it is bad. It's more violence in nature than what we were dealing with in the 80s. But that shit started in the 80s. A lot of that, right. the homophobia, no, yeah. the Reagan administration, all of that crap started back then. But it seems like, I don't know, for some reason, it was almost more accepting. I mean, guys, guys pretending to sort of be metal guys because the hair bands weren't really metal. They sort of took a lot of the guitar histrionics and they used it. They were dressing in their girlfriend's clothes, putting on makeup, teasing their hair to get laid. Straight guys. Right. So if any of them were shocked when Rob Halford came out of the closet, man, they really needed to do some soul searching and go like, well, man, you're pretty comfortable, you know, gender bending, right? Yeah. You have no problem with it. And, and look, goth, the thing that always struck me about the goth scene was the androgyny. There's a lot right. of people that gender fluidity thing was going on back in the 80s as well. It was a, at 70, it was, it was ahead of the curve. Right. I mean, maybe I that's, that. I don't know. I don't know why, what it is, why goth can't, doesn't get embraced in a wider sense. It's one of those genres that just, and I don't have a problem with that. I wish I could write about it more, though. I wish more, a few more people would want to go to the shows and more people would wait so we could see these bands play like a 2000 seed venue. And, you know, like Dead Can Dance, I saw them play in front of 5000 people in Boston in 96, 97. And it was like goths, the symphony crowd, rock people, uh, just like regular people who didn't know yeah, anything world beat people into jazz like dead can dance really did walk a lot of lines and and it and all those people came and i was like this is awesome like i saw a lot of gossip at the show I was like this is great and i mean maybe molecat doma can kind of do that because they don't have the image really necessarily they have the music sure. and they themselves probably don't categorize themselves in any one way and i think a lot of their lyrics in russian are evidently about uh a lot of what's going on in their in their home country in in belarus because the New York Times did cover Molkat Doma at the end of 2020. So that's a rare example of that kind of group, a dark music group getting that coverage. Right. Yeah, through. But no one's covering them. You look up these groups when they tour, look up like a Twin Tribes interview, look up whatever. You're not going to see the big outlets covering them at all or even right. doing what a, a list. I'm just like, it drives me nuts. And I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> well, you know what, Brian? I'm I'm doing my best to to get the word out there. So I'm on that 
you and I right now, I just looked down at the clock, uh, suffered from something where um, I am talk a talker. And now I know that you are a talker. And this oh, is yeah. fun. But I do want to real quick, because I love this and looked at it, um, get a chance to talk a little bit about some of your things outside of goth. So quickly, sure. um, I want to go through some of those where the biggest one is I recently listened to your podcast of Side Jams. Yeah, yeah. And I really, really enjoyed it. I looked at Thank you. you. And so basically, you know, the idea here is that you're talking to musicians and bands in a variety of genres, yeah. Um, but talking to them about kind of like we said, who can just be in a band to make money anymore? Everybody's kind of doing something else, whether it's a hobby, you know, like yeah. this for me, or, you know, they do it as work or something like that. But what's the other part? of these bands lives because nobody just has music as their whole life anymore or very few can pull well, that. Some, a lot of the mainstream people do but a lot of them also just have things i i've done so many interviews over the years like this we talk a lot and you have like like i remember and this is a, this is in movies i interviewed evangeline Lilly, and i think it was on the i think i might have actually been on the first ant-man movie oh. but it was for an american airlines magazine and she talked about her children's books and there's just no space for that I wanted to write about it somewhere I else. I had no idea she does children's books. Yes. I knew she had like kids. You know, I saw an interview yes. talking about that. That's awesome. The Snicker walk or something like that. You check it out. It's interesting. And so yeah. I wanted to place it somewhere else. But the publicist was like, no, we just agreed to this one interview. I'm like, oh, come on. Music publicists are cooler about this stuff than movie publicists. But, you know, I was like, I, I kept interviewing all these people. And I'm like, yeah, I get an extra 30 minutes of really cool shit I can't use anywhere. And I could put it in a book. But, you know, talking to like Andy Beersack from Black Veil Brides about his obsession with Batman, it's kind of obvious, but he could talk about it forever. Um, you know, Liv Christine of you know, Lee's Eyes and Theater of Tragedy fame. Now, a lot of her money comes from teaching because of the whole thing of leaving her, her, her last band and, and everything. And I, you know, Lizzie Hale from Hailstorm loves to paint. And that was her first interview ever talking about painting. Or Ville Valo, that's the biggest one I've had on video, man, because he loves books and his fans just want to hear him talk about books. Like, it's too short. I'm like, well, I'll have him on again. I mean, you know. <laughs> I love that. I mean, we're not, yeah. you and I don't just do one thing. Right, right. And yeah, that's, those no, are interesting interviews sometimes and just saying, tell me about your new album. I mean, and that's just it. Like, that's what was fun about, and I love doing this on this, you know, show too, but like with you just now, I mean, gosh, we just went for, I don't know if you know this, a full hour just now of kind of, and we talked all around the world about everything. Yeah. And, and that's what makes it fun and interesting. So where can people see the show and what are some of the things that uh, you're excited for and have coming up on it of why they should check it out? Uh, so um, the uh, show, just look up Side Jams with Brian Reisman. It's on YouTube. I think you can actually just go to YouTube slash at Side Jams. Um, okay. And, and I'm going to put links to it all when we release this. Yeah. Interview. I mean, you know, I, I have an interview with Joel Hoekstra coming up. He's in Trans-Siberian Orchestra. He's playing yeah. with Whitesnake. I still have Slide It In. It's a, such an un-PC record, but I, I just don't care. Um the alpha male side. You know what? That's a, it's a jam. Hot it, chicks it really and is. you know and and loud guitars is great. Um, and uh, I'm I'm getting one of the guys in from Ashes to New on pretty soon. I think he's he's really into video games, so I'm going to talk to him. I'm trying to figure out who else to get. There's a few people I want to get. I don't want to say yet because like they have some interesting things, and I don't know if people have ever talked to them about it. Yeah. Um, you know, I I would, I would there's a lot of people I'd love. I had Serge Tonkin on about talking about politics. I'd like to get other people on, it, like Danny Phil from Cradle of Filth. We've talked about horror. But now I found out he's in a paintball. So like maybe I should just have him come on and talk about paintball. And those things, and, and people bring, they, you know, I put, some people know, I put photos on screen or video clips. The Joel yeah. Hoekstra one, he's talking about basketball. So I'm going to have images of him playing basketball on the Monsters of Rock cruise and, and, and talking about looking at his life in a different perspective. And that's always fun to see what makes people tick. You know, Adam Sandler was interviewed for 60 minutes. And what does he do when he comes home to New York? He sometimes goes down to the local court and just shoots hoops with a bunch of people he doesn't know. I've heard he's really good too, like genuinely yeah. good at basketball. Apparently, yeah. I mean, you kind know, of like that old story about Prince. I guess that he was legitimately could just slay people at basketball. So I, my friend Ray, actually did publicity for Prince at one point. I think mm -hmm. he was. I know that he had a meeting with him at lunch. So he meets him at this nice restaurant. They're trying to decide what they're going to order, and he's asking Prince a bunch of questions, and he just gives him one answer. Replies like yes, no, yeah, you know. And then, and then finally they order and he Ray's like, you know, is, is everything okay? He's like, nah, I'm just fucking with you. You know? And then after that, they had this normal conversation. I thought that was great. Uh, I also heard that a friend of a friend of mine was at a record store and he was on the stoop by the fire escape, fire exit. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, and then when this woman comes out and says to him, you know, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, you're, you're blocking the fire exits, a fire, fire hazard. Could you please move? He's like, do you know who I am? She's like, yes, Prince, I know who you are. I love your music. Now get the fuck off my stoop. And like his, his assistant came back hours later with tickets to an after party <laughs> that night. He goes, Prince thought that was great. And I, you know, I think he did. I mean, you know, he, he, you hear mixed stories about him sometimes sure. and certain things, but uh, I guess he did have a sense of humor about himself. He didn't really want to necessarily always be the center of attention. Yeah. The sort of autobiography that wasn't finished, you read it and there's stories that where he kind of holds court and then he quietly just slips away and yeah, he's gone. Well, and I think, look, I, I think that probably is true when you get to that level of fame, yeah. you have to split into two people. There is your, I don't know, the world you, and then there's who you really were. And probably yeah. the longer you go on in life, the more blurred that gets, you know? And yeah, yeah. I can, I mean, again, I can't get it, but like, that's what I have to imagine. It's like for a guy like him, or I don't know, a Michael Jackson or something, you know, like people that are on that level, they can't be a normal human being buying milk and going about their day you know what i mean that has to get in your head and get to you at some point i imagine Uh, and i know you've probably crossed paths with that a lot more than i have but even in the times when i have i now i am excited and get to interview people that were heroes to me or that i worshipped when i was young you know and I know you joked about I'm not even that many years younger than you. You know, I, yeah. I you've got a couple on me, but you know, even like an Ethan or or a Sam or somebody like that, when I interview, that was a big deal. Or Voltaire. I mean, because that's what I do as a comedy goth band. Like we do silly songs about like ninjas and ass play in goth music. <laughs> and so when I got to interview Voltaire for me when I was 19 years old and in college. He showed me the music I loved, Sisters and Joy Division, and that yeah. here could be dark, but doesn't have to take itself seriously. In fact, it shouldn't, you know? And that was a big deal in game to do an interview like that and kind of like talk to somebody who was a hero of mine, you know? So no, it it is fun in getting to like enjoy that. The last thing I wanted to touch on here with you, um, because God, I'm just, I'm hoping I get to have you back some other time, Brian. This was absolutely yeah, so much I had a good fun. Time. And we we had a great time and touched on a lot of stuff. But I know you you had the book there that I, you know, that you did about John Bon Jovi. Oh, yeah, this book. I'm a huge fan of right there. And, I believe and I'm also going to pro- I'm also just going to promote. I this was going to say another one coming up that you just edited for there. Tell me um, quickly about, you know, the projects of instead of writing on online magazines or whatnot, some of these literary uh, pieces you got to do in books you have and where people can get those to learn more about the music scene. Well, yeah, I mean, I've been, I've been doing this like almost 20, it's been 28 years. So, you know, I, I, I love balancing online with magazines. Magazines are harder gigs to get because they pay much better. Um, But uh Bon Jovi, just this company, I contributed to a couple of books, The Art of Metal Books. So I actually contributed to this first about 10 years ago. And I wrote a chapter on hair metal. And then uh, and then they wanted a new edition. So then I became officially became co-editor. So I did this section, which is the, uh, the Metal Now section. And that's actually a synthwave cover. Oh, uh, Gost, yeah. G-O-S-T. Especially the wonder. colors. <laughs> it, well, I mean, there's like, here's, there's another, uh, like, I mean, you want to talk about like color, then I have like the comic book section. Oh, very cool. Yeah. You know, um, and it's just, you know, it was, I, you just write about, like, I was writing about merchandising and writing about poster art and writing about like, metal definitely has this big visual contingent. Oh, Goth does too, sure. but metal really back when in the eighties, man, you bought the pins, you had the back patch. Or even the, the album bag. covers, you know, you think of like covers. Megadeth, Metallica, that's a, the album cover a lot of times are what drew you to a record, you know? I mean, yeah. I mean, this, this book was fun to do. And then, then a couple of years later, they approached me. They originally approached me about a Ramones book. So it's a company called Elephant Book in London. They What they do is they put the book together and they sell the rights. Like the English language rights to the Bon Jovi book went to Barnes and Noble. So this was in every Barnes and Noble in the country when it came out pretty much um, in it's November of 2016. So they, they contacted me about a Ramones book and I like the Ramones, but I don't know that much about them. And one of the things I know about being a heavy music fan is if you don't really know your shit, you're going to get crucified. I'm like, you know what? Oh. I like them. But if you want this book in four months, that I, that's not a good idea. I'm not well, your guy. Be, I had a better overall 
understanding and I liked I kind of got into them with the not back in the day because I like thrash and stuff like that but I got into them when they had the big revival so it's like all right you know what I can do this I had the time open and four months of Bon Jovi man I didn't listen to Bon Jovi for three months after that because it was like just constantly playing Bon Jovi and really getting into like you know was it 50 million 100 million Bon Jovi fans kept the big box set yeah back here somewhere um hey. I loved Bon Jovi. I was a big Bon Jovi fan. And people forget, too, there was a distinct time between, like, 88 and, like, 92 yeah. where John Bon Jovi could literally have any woman in America. Rather, it was, like, the mom, the, the daughter. Like, everybody in America was in love with John Bon Jovi. He was that big it was insane and he was married and they still want i mean it didn't matter it was like but it it wasn't even him it was the idea of him you know i think that was like the big concept when we talked earlier about kind of that golden god bigger than that was sambora and bon jovi i mean they were just they were an ideal they were a concept you know even beyond what was your so you listened to all of it then what was your favorite bon jovi track if you had to like oh you know, boy all out because my favorite album is keep the faith oh, which is okay. interesting because that out al- because that album i'm gonna go is- new jersey for that for albums that was my that was my album you know it's funny and it's hard do i think if there's like one completely one favorite bon jovi song i have because you know i'm we're obviously all sick to death of uh, living on a prayer sure. um you know, Runaway is a very underrated track. And even though that was the song that broke them, to be honest with you, a lot of younger fans probably don't know anything about that song. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. I've never thought about my actual favorite Bon Jovi song because I love uh, so much of Keep the Faith. Yeah. It's just gritty. It's a little dark. Um, it's, 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 it's it, and I think some people argue he might have blown out his voice a bit with that album because he yeah. really, he was not a trained singer. Right. You know, um, I'm going to go a little deep cut and say i'll be there for you and, and i think it's, it's it's like one of the cheesiest because i have a as a songwriter myself i think writing a love song that doesn't sound cheese dick is one of the hardest things to do you know like depeche mode uh you know he's done it a few times but it's tough and to me that song is one of both the exact line between cheesy and just heartrending, and i don't know if there's something about that song i've always loved it's interesting and you know david bryan actually did wrote a few songs so i i actually met him he was my friend of mine did make up for his memphis, a memphis show so i went to the hundredth performance party of memphis and he just happened to be there and i met him and i'm sure he's used to all these people coming up and you know knowing he's in bon jovi so i said I have the Netherworld soundtrack. And he looked at me like, really? So, you know, he was in that. I think Edgar Winter Band did some music and he has like a cameo in it. And I talked to him. And so I got an interview with him for Grammy. And I only needed about two quotes for this story on on, yeah. on rockers doing Broadway stuff. And then I used, put it on my blog and then I put it in the book. So, uh, I mean, like, he has a lot of, there's a lot of B-sides uh, that they've done where yeah they even had a i think we rule the night was like this iron maidenish kind of song that they did that didn't make it i think onto the second album um it's funny because like i'm a huge judas priest fan so if you ask me judas priest i'll say you know electric eye the hellion electric eye just the best and interestingly enough a lot of goths seem to like judas priest i remember when they were doing their farewell tour another goths were like i was like really well i think it's the whole like you know hellraiser like leather daddy crossover <laughs> is definitely a big part of goth for sure yeah let, let me actually let me quickly just take a look at like it's funny i've never really thought about my favorite track it's so weird because like i just let's see i'm gonna toss it a couple of interesting ones okay that uh are not i love this i in my interviews about like you know the goth industry i never get to talk about bon jovi enough so <laughs> oh that's funny uh Roulette is one of them. Oh, that's a jam. That's I know. Um, where's this? They actually they had they had to put the track listings for all the albums in here, and I was kind of annoyed. And I'm like, oh, it's great because I can actually refer to it myself. Um, it's so weird. Where it's uh, it, doing the book was interesting, but it was also a tremendous, tremendous amount of work, and I was really tired by the end of it. Um, I I can imagine, and and especially like you said, when you're diving that deep, you know, when I do an article. 
I'll listen to a band record, you know, five, six times to do a review or something. But if you're writing an actual book, that's going to be your words forever and ever immortalized. I imagine you have to do a deep dive that kind of transcends the, what would be comfortable that amount of listening. Oh, it was, it was crazy. All right. Just like one more thing up here. It's weird. Some of the stuff, here we go. Uh, okay. That's what I'll do. You can edit this in. Uh, I mean, some of the tracks I really like, and they're it seem like a little left field is Roulette, you know, uh, from the, that's the first album. And then there's Fear, which is a really hard rocking song from Keep the Faith. Um, and with a wicked guitar solo. Yes. And while not like, I would say that's a, to be one of the like all time Bon Jovi solos like that, that definitely that is a, a real fretboard fireworks you know, which saying, isn't always their their mo. Yeah, I mean, one wild night, which is sort of the Latinish closing track yeah. off of off off of uh, Crush. There's stuff that they do that's interesting. Richie's solo album is interesting because it was very different. I worked retail when that came out, and my manager loved that album. There are rumors it got squashed because John had this massive hit with his first album with Blaze of Glory. Yeah, it's like sort of movie soundtrack, and then. Uh, and then Richie has this album that starts to do a you know, stranger in this town, which starts to do well. And there's the rumor that either he or somebody at the label were like, if both these guys have hit albums, we're not going to get them back together. Are they so going to come back together to do? Bob and so because evidently it was going up the radio charts. And when his, a friend of his, Ray Richard, the book was saying this, it just suddenly stalled. And it made no sense that this, this whole thing suddenly stalled. And so it was just kind of like, I was like, wow, really? Um, so, you know, I I mean, there's there's a lot of other Only Lonely is a fun song also because that video was like a fake movie trailer and everyone thought they'd made a right. movie and there was no movie that ever came out about it. Um, Runaway is always, is always fun just because and it, of course, Runaway, he didn't write. I mean, he has a co-songwriting credit, but basically he changed like two lyrics, two lines of lyrics in the song. It was, it was written by George Carrack. So that's oh, why that song is so that. different. And that's why they were struggling. And that's why they had to bring in Desmond Child for that stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff from the, the, the uh, of the classic stuff, but for some reason I go for the, a lot of times go for the grittier stuff. I think some of the songs on Bounce, some of the harder rocking songs, like the opening track, Undivided, it's really metal. I'm like, yeah. So I don't go for like, you know, who says you can't go home and all that stuff. <laughs> Whatever. There's it's it's it is it was interesting doing it. I I you know the next book I want to do, I, I think I want to do something on more of a genre of music or about horror movies or something. Is this books are a hard sell these days. I mean, you can sell a book, but how much money you're going to get is the issue. Right. Um, you know, so I, we'll see. <laughs> well, Brian, I tell you, this has been truly delightful. It's been great talking to you. Likewise, and, thank you. And I, we will have to do something like this again. This was really great. And maybe we can uh, come up with an idea for a topic for us to talk about on stuff like this. But everybody, please uh, go to YouTube, look up Side Jams. I, I watched, I think, five episodes and really enjoyed all of them and felt wow. like I learned a lot from it. Nice, um, thank you. And the, the books that are out there, and then most importantly, I'll put the link in here of the Grammy article that brought Brian to my attention and, and got us talking about this. But Thank you for being an advocate for this scene and looking for ways to get some mainstream juice to, to me, uh, a goth renaissance and a lot of bands that are deserving of it that maybe don't always get that attention. So thank you for doing that. And it's been a real pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. For all of you out there in interweb land, keep it dark, yeah. <laughs>